the data from the SAC files and put it in the um, MATLAB format that we use for, um, we're going to use for this tutorial. Um, so did everyone have a chance to run this and did it work successfully? Any issues with that? I see one thumbs up. Hi, Helen. This is Caroline here, if you can hear me. Um, yeah. I was able to run it yesterday, but I had to, I don't know if it's my version or something, but I had to make a slight modification to the okay. MATLAB setup to get it to work on mine. And okay. I, I don't know if it was just me, but um, mine seemed to have an issue with the year function. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I will say we um, did a run through of the tutorial over the weekend and added a couple of updates to things uh, as we found bugs. Um, and so, yeah, the year function, there's a couple of um, MATLAB toolboxes right now that the code assumes that you have. And we're in the process of trying to uh, provide alternative functions for the people who don't have the toolboxes. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a work in progress. So that was one of those functions and it's been added, a, a supplement uh, alternative options been added now to the um, actual main attacker um, GitHub. Yeah, no worries. I managed to get a workaround, but all okay. good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there um, should be a new uh, year function in the, in the attacker GitHub now. But, yeah. Um, okay, but so once we have all of the files set up uh, in a format that we can use with the code, um, basically, let's just take a minute and look over here at the current folder um, structure on the left in MATLAB. Um, so this is all of the scripts that run as part of the attacker package, and they're nicely numbered um, with A, uh, 0 through 4, and B, uh, 1 through 4, in order uh, in which you would run them. Uh, so normally, you would go ahead and um, uh, first either download your data, or if you have existing SAC data, convert it to a format that we use for um, this code. And then the next step um, would be A2, which is day data pre-process. Um, so Josh, if you want to open that one up. Yep. Okay. And so if we look here, um, there's a couple of options that we're gonna change from the default uh, version that you download for today's tutorial. Um, there's a couple of user parameters up here that are specified in the beginning. Um, so uh, actually, sorry, Josh, can you go up to the poll zero dir first? Uh, uh, in the script. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So um, first of all, there's you can either remove the response or not remove the response before um, calculating the transfer functions. And so um, uh, if you do want to remove the response, uh, you would then put in a directory to where uh, you have SAC uh, PZ files in that. And there's a response removal function that will then be implemented. Um, then you have uh, options for the network name of your seismic network, uh, input to a text file that has a list of the station files, station names um, that you're going to be analyzing, um, and then uh, channel names um, for your vertical, horizontal one, horizontal two, and pressure components uh, there. Um, and those can vary depending on what particular type of seismic instrument you're using. Um, and then the part that you will have to change from the default in the code is uh, down there, which I think Josh will highlight. Yes. So basically, these are four variables um, which tell the code to do or not do certain pre-processing techniques. Um, so the first is uh, whether or not you're going to remove the response for each channel. Um, again, you can choose whether or not you want to do this. Um, transfer functions are a ratio, so it doesn't really matter if you do this step before or after um, you do the corrections. Um, and so for today, we're just not going to be worrying about removing response from the instrument. So those should all be set to zero um, uh, to avoid um, uh, performing the response removal. The second one is gain correction. Um, and so this is if you 
know there is an issue with the gain of your seismometer for whatever reason. Um, this is basically you would just put in a number that is a factor that you want to multiply your data by before you do any of the um, processing. Again, this doesn't really affect the calculation of your transfer function that much, um, but it's just an opportunity to fix an issue with the data if you know it already exists. Um, so again, no gain corrections with the data today, so uh, all of those should be set to one to just multiply the data by one. The next one is the sample rate. Um, and so oftentimes you will want to downsample your data um, significantly before you do these uh, analyses. Um, the spectra files will get very large if you try to do them on the full sample rate data. Um, so you want to make sure that you're, you know, using a sample rate that still makes sense um, in terms of whatever final analysis you want to do with the data. Um, today we're going to just use a sample rate for one sample a second, um, and I believe that is different than what the default is in the um, uh, uh, code as downloaded from GitHub, so you should change that to one from five. Um, an important thing is the sample rate does need to be the same between all four components of um, the instrument. And so uh, you only specify one value there. Um, and in fact, there is a check later on in the code to make sure that all four components have the same sample rate and it will automatically downsample to the highest, co highest common sample rate um, if uh, there's an error there. Um, the last one of these functions, uh, variables, is um, the application of a high-pass filter. Um, basically, this is just to remove very, very long periods, uh, uh, p sources of long period noise. Um, so the corner of this is specified at 1,000 seconds um, and passes everything higher than that. Uh, this is normally done in the response removal, um, but if you don't remove the response, you still want to apply this filter. Um, otherwise, you get weird sorts of drifts that can interfere sometimes. Um, so uh, basically, if you have zero in the vector for your response removal, you want to have a one in the vector in the HP field. Um, if you have one in the response removal, you want to have zero in the HP field. Um, everything else should be the same. So once you have changed those, uh, you can go ahead and um, try running the code and let me or Josh know if there are any issues. Yeah, and I guess maybe if um, you're ready if you, you're successful and ready to move on, either like thumbs up or like add a, I think if you say yes, then it actually like stays over you, so. Apparently, yes does not stay over you. It also still disappears. Oh, well. <laughs> um, is it OK if we move on to the next step? Anyone have any issues if we move on? OK, I'm going to assume we're good to move on. Um, so the next one is uh, A4 that we're going to run uh, event data preprocess. And so this is very similar to the one that we just ran, um, except uh, when you run attacker, you will have a folder of noise data and you will have a folder of event data. Um, and so event data would be the, um, if you're doing, if you're going to apply these corrections to a, a set of earthquakes, right? That would be the data you've downloaded that surrounds when the um, earthquake uh, arrivals are at your seismometer. Um, so event data preprocess applies the same um, preprocessing techniques to the event data as we just applied to the noise data. Um, 
So again, these need to be slightly changed from what the default values are. Um, uh, but so you can go ahead and do that and then run that on the example event data that we have. Um, and the one important thing here is that the way you process the noise data has to be identical to the way you process the event data. Otherwise, you will not calculate accurate transfer functions for your event data. Um, so those values need to be the same um, across these two scripts. I should also mention, um, as we're just getting started with this, that you know these codes are a work in progress. And so if anyone has um, suggestions or ideas of how to improve them, um, uh, please, you know, feel free to either let us know today or let us know sometime in the future. Um, definitely always looking for suggestions to improve and especially looking for any people who want to contribute improvements. So that's always great. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, is everyone ready to move on to the next step? Any questions or anything? I just ask a, a jump in here. Um, yeah. do, do people know where you got these event times from? And I just think that's an important piece to, to mention that this is a separate text file that needs to be pre-made before attacker. Oh yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thanks, Colton. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, code, again, this is assuming that you already have some sort of earthquake catalog um, where you populated the um, uh, uh, earthquakes that you want to actually analyze. And so there is an additional um, text file that gets read um, that Josh just pulled up somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, so there's this event times text file, um, which that just has the um, uh, start time for the event of interest. And that basically just points to the file name um, that we're interested in. Um, and there's a similar start times text as well, um, which is um, a uh, list of um, the start times for the noise data um, that you'll be downloading. Um, and uh, implementing in the um, in the attacker package. One just one thing to point out with this um, is that the like the way that the attacker code ends up working is selecting the day nearest to the earthquake to apply the correction. So um, so the start time file um, you would want to be yeah you can sort of tell, you could tell it how many days in advance you want it to include, um, for example, but probably just using the day before the event is, is one way to do it. Um, but, the, but the nice thing about having many days is that it, it sort of helps out with the quality control step. So, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see that later. Yeah. Um, okay, so Josh, do you want to open up the setup parameter folder uh, file? Okay, so now this is getting into um, the main actual running of this uh, code to calculate the transfer functions um, and eventually correct the data. So the bulk of everything you would want to specify is within this setup parameter uh, folder for the functions b1 through b4, or scripts b1 through b4. Um, so the first couple of these are just, again, path names um, to uh, various directories where you're going to be loading the data from um, and uh, outputting um, your data, uh, as well as information about the network and the list of stations that you're going to use, um, as well as um, lists of acceptable names for the channels um, for the four components that you'll be investigating. Um, we're just going to briefly go through some of these other um, uh, values that are specified here. Uh, the manual goes into more detail about these, um, and I'm also happy to talk more specifically about these um, if people have detailed questions 
Um, but in general, for most applications, um, you will probably not need to change these that much. Um, so the first uh, one under spectral properties windowing, that's simply just talking about how you're going to window uh, your noise data when calculating the spectra. Um, this is currently breaking everything up into two hour windows. Um, and that is also going to be the uh, time range that is expected for the event seismogram that you're gonna put in. So um, again, this is designed or was designed for um, uh, correcting data for surface waves. Um, so we're windowing data, uh, a day of data into two hour segments to calculate um, noise spectral properties. And then when we go and we actually correct the event, we're feeding in a two hour long seismogram uh, into the correction. Um, overlap, that's just for the taper of the window that's um, being used to calculate uh, the spectra. Um, and again, that can probably stay the same um, unless you have a good reason where you would wanna change that. Um, the next one are the quality control parameters. Um, and as I mentioned, there's two steps of quality control that get applied in this code. The first is um, uh, looking at um, identifying any anomalous windows of uh, data within a day of noise data. Um, and that's uh, the properties for quality control parameters for daily windows. Um, first one is just the frequency bands in which the um, uh, quality control is being applied. Tolerance is um, uh, what level of uh, difference in standard deviation um, uh, you will um, be willing to accept for uh, an anomalous window. So punchline basically is that if you increase this tolerance value, you will have a um, looser quality control being applied to the data. If you decrease the tolerance value, you have a stricter quality control being applied to the data. Um, again, for the daily windowing, I would generally recommend that these stay the same. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility in the deployment um, quality control, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, lastly, min-win is, um, basically a way for us to say if we need at least 10 windows, 10 two hour windows uh, to be good in order to say it is worth calculating a spectra um, for that day of data. If we have less than 10 windows, we're basically saying, well, the data is super weird and variable and we probably don't want to be calculating a transfer function using that data anyway, so we're just going to throw it out. So we throw out the whole day if fewer than two, 10 windows um, uh, are present. So uh, again, that should probably be the same um, or about the same for most applications of this code. Um, moving down, um, so I show very briefly this idea of um, trying to find the maximum, the, the orientation of the tilt direction, um, which is really detailed in much more uh, gory detail in Bell et al. Um, so I would definitely recommend that paper if you're interested in this tilt orientation calculation. That's just simply though, a um, uh, we're specifying the frequency range in which we are looking for um, that uh, orientation direction. And um, that is set equal to the values that are used in Bell et al. Um, so again, um, for replicating their technique, uh, you would want to leave it the same. Um, then we get to quality control for the deployment. Um, and so once you have calculated the spectral properties for many, many individual days of data for a particular instrument, there's then a second round of quality control that gets applied to um, comparing each one of those days of data to each other. And basically the reason for this is that uh, the first quality control metric, if you have a day where the station is just broken, um, it has no way of identifying that day is bad. Um, because it's just comparing all the windows to each other, all the windows look the same, 
And so it's um, going to fail at actually identifying that data is bad. The second quality control step is what goes and says, okay, let's compare each day of data with all the other days during the deployment. And if one of them really looks anomalous, we want to throw that one out as well. Um, so uh, the variables are basically the same um, as what we have specified um, uh, or similar uh, for the daily windows because it's the same type of quality control that's being implemented. Um, I would say here that tolerance depth value is something that might uh, you might toy with um, potentially changing if you notice that a lot of days of data um, or not enough days of data seem to be getting thrown out um, because there is a dependence on how many days of download data you actually download, how long the OBS deployment was. Um, and so uh, messing around with that value can um, be something that is useful um, uh, depending on um, your, your data set. Any questions on any of this so far? <laughs> I feel like I'm teaching a class. <laughs> Um, so then uh, we have transfer function options. Um, this is um, basically you can see the convention labeled in here in the comments um, for what exactly all of these mean. Um, there, you can basically make a choice about whether or not you want to um, remove just compliance or tilt and compliance. Um, there's also this uh, rotational uh, correction, which you can read about more in Bell et al. Um, versus a uh, uh, which which rotates the horizontal into the direction of um, maximum tilt, and then just removes um, the transfer function for that rotated horizontal, as opposed to removing um, the uh, tilt noise for the two horizontal directions individually. Um, so again, for this, I would read the reference papers, Bell et al and um, Crawford and Webb in more detail um, in order to really understand exactly what um, these uh, all mean. Um, but basically you can specify whatever order or um, type of transfer function you want to between the components here. Um, again, they're all, about correcting the vertical data. So it's always for um, Z with something else. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you, this is where if you wanted to try and change the order and see what happens, um, you could change the order um, in, in here. Um, and then the last um, things, this is just a brief uh, taper on um, when you actually uh, are uh, loading in the seismic data, um, this probably shouldn't need to change. Um, TF op, so again, this is whether or not you wanna use um, a, a daily transfer function or an average transfer function. And basically what that means is that if you know the noise properties are varying over the deployment, you might want to use a transfer function that's only calculated from a day or a couple of days of data um, prior to when your earthquake happens um, because the transfer function is varying and you want the transfer function that is accurate for when that earthquake occurred. Um, so if that's the case, you would set that option to one. If um, the transfer functions are very stable over the course of a deployment, and then you um, could just use a deployment average transfer function and you would set it to two. Um, again, a lot of this is getting to a level of like more in the weeds. Um, you know, for, for by and large, for most applications of these techniques, there's not that much difference um, between applying um, these two different varieties of a, of a transfer function. Um, but if you really <laughs> want to get the most out of your data set, um, that's something where you can fiddle around uh, with that. Um, and then lastly, uh, you don't necessarily need or want to apply your transfer function for all frequencies of interest. Um, so you might say you only want to apply the transfer function in the compliance band and avoid applying the transfer function in the microseism band. Um, and so this is basically where you can specify um, what frequencies you want to um, apply the transfer function. Um, and so there's a 
option here, um, which is when it's set to two, which is basically um, going to be adaptive to the predicted um, frequency of the infragravity wave uh, cutoff for the water depth of instrument that you're using. Um, and then there's also a way that you can override that and um, uh, put in your own specific um, uh, frequency limits that you uh, want to use for the transfer function. And I will say this is one area where we probably should offer easy, more user options um, of, of different ways of doing this, but that's something we don't have implemented in the code right now. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay, so let's try running it. So um, first is opening B1. And so this is the daily state spectra. For all of these codes, um, there are options for whether or not you want to make figures, whether or not you want to save figures, and whether or not you want to overwrite pre-existing data uh, at the top of these codes. Um, but otherwise, the set of parameters are specified in that set of parameter file. Um, so for today, we're going to spit out all the figures um, so we can take a look at them. And so uh, yeah, go ahead and give running this code a try. And this is usually the um, most time intensive part of the code um, to run. Well, besides downloading the data sometimes, but once you get past that, this is the one that takes the longest. I guess one, one thing that can be mentioned really quickly while we wait for this is that if you're, yeah, so actually downloading your own data, um, you would, you could, you, like, you would basically want to use either download data or SAC to mat. So SAC to mat is just basically you would use if you already have SAC files made and you want to just load those into, into this code, like you've already downloaded the data. Um, and A1 would be, download data would be if, you don't have any data and you want to just have everything kept kind of like within this attacker code. But that's sort of up to you. I've, I've actually personally, I've only ever used the SAC to mat, so download data outside of this and then load it in, but um, either way, it's sort of up to you. However, works best with your workflow. Okay, so um, for the quality control parameter, why use um, 0.004 to 0.2 the frequency band is very long period. Um, so again, for most OBS instruments um, where you are going to be actually applying these corrections is in the long period. Um, so that is a um, pretty reasonable kind of average um, set of values where you would expect these noise um, uh, sources to influence the data. Um, if you are thinking about doing kind of some more novel techniques with um, trying to apply this to ambient noise in shorter periods, um, then you might uh, think about changing that um, uh, in terms of um, how much, uh, you, what period bands you actually care about, you know, getting accurate transfer functions for. Um, but yeah, but for, for the standard tilt and compliance corrections, these are more long period corrections. So that's kind of a, a standard band that um, is uh, useful for deep to shallow water instruments. Um, okay, so we've now got a smattering of the um, types of figures that are spit out by this. Um, so I think this is just, okay, so figure 96, um, which is showing spectrograms for 
uh, vertical, horizontal one, horizontal two, and pressure. Um, one of these will be spit out for every single day of data that you analyze if you have this figure option turned on. So again, depending on you know what you're interested in, you, you may or may not um, want that many figures spit out. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is um, the little <laughs> plot at the bottom that has the stars. Basically, it's plotting a star if the window was flagged as good. Um, and uh, does not plot a star if the window is flagged as bad. So you can see that, you know, across um, the components there, there's definitely some sort of a little discontinuity that's pretty visible, um, and that window is getting flagged as bad. It's also actually a good point in follow-up to that question about the frequency bands. Again, because we mostly care about long periods, you can see that there is a difference in the, you know, higher frequencies um, uh, in the left part of those spectrograms versus the right part of the spectrograms, but we don't really care about that step change um, because that's not the frequency band in which we're going to be applying the transfer functions. We just care about the very long period variation. Um, so for this, um, then figure one is also a plot that will get spit out for every single day of data if you have that plotting option turned on. Um, and this is now actually showing the individual spectra calculated for every single one of these windows in the um, uh, spectrogram. And so um, vertical, horizontal one, horizontal two, and pressure. Again, uh, on the left, um, in black, we're plotting the ones that are flagged as good. In red, it plots any windows that were flagged as bad. Um, so for example, you can see that it was clearly something anomalous on two horizontal components that kicked um, that window out um, for that particular day. Um, and uh, on the right, um, it's then plotting the daily average. So once you add all those windows together and actually get an average spectra for the day, um, in black is uh, with the good windows. Um, in red is if you added up all the windows, including the bad windows. Um, and so this one, it's a pretty minor effect how much uh, that one window has on the overall spectra. Um, but you can definitely see it does have an influence. And there's definitely days where you see um, much more significant influences. Um, so, you know, it, even these singular windows do have an effect on the um, uh, what the noise profile looks like of these instruments. Um, uh, then lastly, the other two figures that get spit out are these orientation. So again, this is um, if you're interested in the orientation of the um, tilt noise direction. So basically, again, refer to Bell et al. for more detail on exactly what this is doing, um, or the manual as well. But it's basically going and rotating your horizontal components and looking for the point where you have maximum coherence between um, your vertical and horizontal channel. Um, if you have strong unidirectional tilt, you would expect very high coherence um, for the maximum direction. If you don't have strong unidirectional tilt, um, you would expect very low coherence. So this is an example where um, there really isn't strong unidirectional tilt. So you can see uh, on figure 90, the bottom panel value of maximum coherence for each day getting plotted. And you know it's highest at about 0.2. So this is not an instrument that has a strong unidirectional tilt motion. Um, and uh, it's plotting in the above panel what the actual orientation value is. Um, you can see it's varying, but that's not really that meaningful because it's a weak signal anyway. Um, so uh, I you know, wouldn't necessarily interpret that top panel as meaning anything. However, if you have very high coherence in the bottom panel and you see variation in the orientation direction in the top panel that is indicating that there is a, some sort of a directional drift of tilt um, over your deployment period. Um, so that would be something to potentially pay attention to. Um, any questions, any issues anyone's run into? Uh, okay, um, so then we can move on to the next one. Uh, 
Um, so the next one is B2 clean state spectra. And so again, this is once you have calculated daily station spectra, a uh, daily daily spectra for your station for a bunch of days during your deployment, um, you would then, uh, this is running the second quality control step, which is going to um, look at the, um, uh, compare the days of data over the entire deployment. And so you can go ahead and run that. Again, the only options at the top of this code are whether or not you want to plot and save figures or if you want to overwrite data. organize all the figures it spits out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this spits out four figures. Um, and this is the first point in the code where you really start looking at the coherence, admittance, and phase um, for different components uh, of the instrument. Um, and so now again, this is where every single individual line that's being plotted in these plots is from one day of data. And we're looking at a month of data in this example data set. Um, gray colors are indicating um, the days that have been flagged as good. Red colors are indicating the days that have been flagged as bad for whatever reason um, and are getting thrown out again by the quality control. Um, so, and yeah, again, it's worth emphasizing that the quality control is set up to throw out all four components if it finds any one component um, to look bad um, by the definitions that are set up in the quality control parameters. So um, for example, you can see that like there's definitely some that are really just exclusively being driven by the pressure components there. Um, it's worth mentioning again that a lot of this, um, calculation of transfer functions, if you do it accurately and you're putting enough data into um, the calculations that if you have a couple of good days that get thrown out um, or even like one or two bad days that creep in, it's not the end of the world. Um, as long as the majority of your data set is good, um, that's usually going to be enough to still get you a well-defined transfer function. Um, but there are times where you know you you do need to adjust the quality control parameters um, a bit more to um, toy around with this. But this is a really nice example of a station that has really, really strong compliance noise. Um, so this is a shallow water station. And so we can see here in um, looking at the coherence between the pressure and the vertical component there. Um, there's definitely one day that's gotten thrown out because clearly there's an error in the pressure. Um, but pretty much every single other day of data um, has really, really high coherence over this wide frequency band, um, which is due to the compliance noise. Um, and so uh, you don't really see that much high coherence at longer periods in the um, coherence with the vertical and horizontals. I will also mention that this is a shallow water instrument. So it's a shelf instrument um, deployed in about 150 meters of water. Shallow water instruments are a little weird. Um, so if you're using shallow water instruments, always be a bit more careful. And I would say the definition of shallow starts roughly at 300 meters. Um, and what's weird about this is this peak um, at about 16 seconds that you're seeing uh, with the coherence between the horizontals, um, and the vertical, as well as the coherence between the horizontals and the pressure. Um, this has something to do with that increase in the primary microseism noise that is seen on shallow water instruments. Um, and in fact, actually, if you look 
for example, at that 2z coherence, um, if you go and you turn to the phase diagram, um, which is figure three, you'll notice that it's about 90 degrees um, for the phase relationship. So that's something to do with Rayleigh waves, basically, from the microseism. Um, but it's kind of, it's still unclear to me exactly what's going on with that. Um, so uh, it's just something to be aware of that that extra peak is pretty common to see in shallow water instruments, um, but not talked about too much in the literature that is uh, too much. Um, yeah, but so if we continue looking at the coherence, uh, excuse me, the, the properties between the pressure and the vertical component, because that is the main source of compliance noise, um, high coherence, if you look at figure four on the right, um, with the admittance, what you'll notice is that there's a really smooth admittance function in the periods where you have high coherence, and also for all of the individual days of data, that admittance value is about the same. So again, the admittance is the gain of the transfer function. Um, and so the fact that it's very smooth and it's about the same for every single day of data is really strong evidence that this is a well-resolved transfer function. Um, and so it's going to be a very, do a very good job at um, removing compliance noise from your data set for that instrument. Um, and yeah, and then again, just briefly to touch on the phase, um, the main point here is that you're going to just have random scatter for any place where you have uh, low coherence between the data. Um, but when you do have high coherence, you should see some sort of systematic phase relationship, um, which uh, we do see here for the vertical and the pressure components. Um, they have a phase relationship of zero degrees. Um, Phase can be a useful place to sometimes identify um, if you have any flipped components on your OBS instruments. Um, so if you, um, you know, see uh, for a particular design of OBS instrument, if most of your instruments have phase of zero between your pressure and vertical, but if you have like phase of 180 or negative 180, um, there might be an issue with one of those component directions being flipped, um, and you might want to check that. Um, uh, but of course, it's not that easy because the different designs of OBS don't necessarily use the same definition for up and down for your pressure components. So, you know, it's it's not necessarily always zero um, or always 180, obviously. Um, so it, it can vary depending on the type of instrument that you're using. Um, trying to think if there's anything else to point out here. Does anyone have any questions on any of this? Oh, I guess one other thing too is that um, occasionally you might have clock drift on these instruments, in which case you might see a very strange striping of phase going on um, uh, between some of your components um, if they're not line if the time series are not lined up with one another. So again, if you see high coherence um, and you don't see a constant phase relationship. Um, that is also an indication that there's probably something going wrong with the instrument, um, and it's a good way to, to flag that. Um, okay, any questions? Uh, okay, what is the long period sensitivity of these instruments? There's good coherency in places at many hundreds of seconds or long periods. Yeah, so part of this, so first of all, the one of the hard limits of this is the um, what sort of filter you're using in the response removal. Um, uh, cause again, remember we've got that high pass filter that we're applying to the data. Um, and I think, so Adrian Dora and Gabby Lasky have looked into this in more detail at trying to figure out, um, you know, what is kind of the long period and sensitivity of these instruments. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would definitely just, re they've come up out with, um, several papers in the last two, three or so years. Um, so that's a really good reference for a more detailed discussion on what the kind of long period limits of um, these uh, techniques are. I know that um, like the Crawford and Webb paper, they sort of point out this drop in the, the uh, compliance noise out past like a thousand seconds. And, and I think they actually interpret that as like a real 
compliance signal, like the compliance does actually go away out there. And it's not, it's not just that the instruments are like no longer sensitive to it. Yeah. Um, if that's kind of what you're asking. Yeah. But These but are I also 120 second instruments, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, but, but, yeah, and I mean, it's true that for this instrument, maybe that is the sensitivity, but I think there, there is like, by the time you get out to a thousand seconds, I think the micro or the compliance should mostly be like gone. Yeah, no, these, these are 120. Most, so OBS is um, in the US OBS pool are mostly 120 instruments. Um, there are 240s though as well. Um, so there should be a little bit of variation there. Yeah, and so because that's the corner and we're not doing response removal, you still have sensitivity beyond that 120. It's just going down and going down. We're just not trying to see past it, which is some of the patterns I think might be what Joe was asking. Mm. When you say 120, are you talking about 120 samples? Sample no, 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 no. The, it, the, um, You're talking about like the the frequent, the... Um, yeah. The, the long period corner frequency. So uh, you have a flat yeah. response out yeah. to 120 seconds. Yeah, yeah. And then you still get response at longer periods. Yeah. It's just no longer the full amplitude that you would get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so we can, I think, move on to the next one, unless there's any other questions. Um, so the next is B3 calc trans funk, um, which is basically the step where you calculate the transfer functions. Um, and it's set up to calculate a transfer function for every single day of data as well as an average transfer function for um, uh, all of the days of data that you have provided um, uh, this code for running. So uh, go ahead and run it. <laughs> that was weird. So any days that have been flagged as bad are excluded. Um, so if that doesn't get counted into your final average. Um, but this again is the transfer function, you know, is both a, a real and complex um, uh, function. And so we're just plotting the um, real part of it, which is essentially basically the admittance. Um, but what's a little bit different about this is you'll see, um, so it's plotting it for all the different kind of steps of transfer function that were specified in the setup parameter file. Um, so for example, this top one is ZP. So that's literally just the admittance plot between the vertical and the pressure like we just looked at that in the previous. Um, but then we have transfer function Z1 that is also the admittance between the vertical and horizontal one. Um, but then Z2 minus one. So that is now having removed um, the coherent noise between Z and horizontal one, what the transfer function is now between Z and horizontal two. Um, ZP minus two one is having removed both horizontal one and horizontal two, what the um, transfer function is between Z and P. Um, and uh, for example, you'll notice that that one ZP minus two one looks very similar to ZP, again, because most of the coherent noise um, uh, that's present for this instrument is the compliance noise. And so uh, removing the horizontal noise doesn't really have that much of an impact on um, the, uh, the actual data because it's all low coherence anyway. Um, and so uh, the um, bulk of any sort of correction you're going to get um, is going to be coming from the compliance noise removal. Um, and then, yeah, just below we have um, uh, the alternative way of removing tilt, which is where we've rotated um, into the maximum, the horizontals into the maximum tilt direction, calculate a transfer function, and then calculate um, ZP minus H. Um, you'll notice that that looks a little bit wonkier. Again, though, going back to the first um, code that we ran, you know, this was not a function that had um, a very strong unidirectional tilt um, noise. 
And so it's uh, not that surprising that um, the transfer function for that looks a bit rattier um, than the transfer function um, for ZP minus two one because we're, we don't have a good sense of what direction we would want to um, uh, orient the instrument to remove the tilt noise. Um, so that would not be a technique you would want to use for this instrument. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, and then the last one we would run is B4 correct event. And so this is where we actually then implement the calculated transfer functions to our uh, data that is supposedly includes seismograms um, that we would want to actually use for analysis. Um, and so this has a couple of additional parameters that get specified at the top of it. So again, there's plotting parameters and whether or not you want to overwrite things. Um, so there's also a, a filter period range um, for plotting your seismic data. So this is going to actually put out some time series plots. Um, and so this is just the um, bounds for the band pass that's going to be used for that filtering. Um, then again, file directories. Um, and uh, the last one is a list of bad stations. Um, so again, you would be, you, these are all designed to be run at kind of the deployment level. So we're running it for one station today, but you know, normally you would have your entire network and it's going to loop over all the stations that you input in the station file. Um, and so sometimes there might be a uh, station that you know has a bad component for whatever reason. And obviously you don't want to um, apply a transfer function that has been calculated from a bad component. Um, but again, because of the way the quality control system works, if the station has that component bad for the entire deployment, there is never going to be a way that the quality control to pick, uh, it, will, it will not be able to pick up that that is bad. You need to tell it uh, manually what's bad and what's good. Um, so this is just a place where you would put in any text files um, for bad um, vertical components, horizontal components, or pressure components. Um, I mean, if it's vertical, if the vertical component is bad, any amount of correction is not going to fix things. So, you know, that's just a bad station. Um, but for horizontal and pressure, um, you might avoid applying a tilt or compliance correction um, uh, if one of those components is bad. Um, but if uh, you don't have any bad stations, you can just leave these values as default. If those file names don't exist, the code basically just skips over it. Um, so we can go ahead and run that. And so these are the output plots from this. Um, and so this first one on the right, 101, that's just plotting the original data. Um, so vertical component in the top, horizontal one, horizontal two, and then pressure. Um, and so again, the main thing to take away from this is that uh, there's definitely no evidence of any sort of earthquake in this data uh, plotted as is right now. Um, and so again, all of these corrections are for corrections to the vertical component. So unfortunately, there isn't anything we can do to get better data on the horizontals, but we can get better data on the vertical. Um, so then that's what figure 102 is showing. Um, and so um, basically, it's plotting corrected data for every kind of step of the transfer function that you have specified. Um, so again, all of these are given in the um, titles for those plots. So Z uh, corrected for horizontal one, um, Z corrected for horizontal two, taking into account horizontal one, Z corrected for pressure, taking into account horizontal two and one, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, 
really obvious. It's clear that um, it's the pressure correction that is having the largest impact on the data. Um, so all the ones that have uh, where the transfer function with the pressure component has been implemented is showing the um, cleanest uh, seismogram. And so um, again, too, this is a pretty good demonstration of where, you know, I've been saying a couple of these things, the specifics of um, what type of transfer function you use and, um, uh, you know, exactly how many days of data get included or thrown out gets a little bit in the weeds because by and large, um, if you compare that third panel, ZP minus two one, um, to ZP minus H, the fourth panel, and uh, ZP at the bottom, they all look pretty similar. Um, uh, you know, there's subtle differences in them, and clearly ZP minus two one is looking the best, um, but they're not really that, that different from one another. Um, and so for most applications that you're going to be applying, um, uh, this analysis to um, in order to produce a seismic data set that you can then use in other um, types of investigations. It's again, very in the weeds in terms of worrying about the details of what specific um, transfer function uh, you use and things like that. Um, but, you know, it, it does matter more if you want to push this to like lower and lower magnitude earthquakes or other types of signals. Um, so there definitely are areas where you might start to really try to actually get the best um, correction that you can. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, very, very clear that um, uh, it's second order variations between those three results um, compared to the original data that you started with. Um, and yeah, you know, again, I mean, I, I mentioned this in the talk, but again, I really just want to emphasize that like, you know, this is data that is filtered in the same band um, from the original to the corrected. So uh, this is a shallow water instrument. It's a very, very noisy instrument um, uh, typically. But uh, if you just looked at that original Z component and did a quality control analysis on the data without actually performing these corrections, you would think your data is trash. Like, right? You would think that that is a horrible, horrible data set um, and you're not gonna be able to do anything with it, but that's absolutely not true. Um, and so it's really important to make sure that you apply these corrections to get the most out of your data set, um, to accurately assess how successful your experiment was. You know, don't like if you went and did an OBS deployment and you get a bunch of data back and you want to know how well you did, um, then uh, you want to make sure that you're looking at the data post corrections um, because, you know, these are expensive deployments and we really do want to make sure that we're getting the most out of these data sets as possible. And so it's, it's very important to um, make sure we're using the right techniques to do that. Um, and then lastly, the last figure is just same thing, um, but we're also looking at a plot in the spectral domain um, of the, uh, differences between the um, original and corrected data. So you can see, um, you know, what frequencies uh, we have the largest effect um, from this transfer function. Um, and uh, this is basically using that difference in um, uh, power to find the lowest noise um, uh, transfer function and then plotting that. And in this case, it's Z minus, uh, ZP minus two one. Um, so that's what worked well for that station. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, any questions on any of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I should just mention to you, like, for running for this example, again, we're only running it for one instrument today. Um, and uh, we turned, you know, all the figure plotting on. And I, I do recommend, certainly at the um, station level, it is useful to have those figures made for you to evaluate. Because again, this is looking at those, it's important to build like kind of an intuition for a particular depth of instrument, what these noise spectra should look like, what those coherence functions should look like, so that you can identify when something has gone wrong. Um, and so at the station level, it's usually a good thing um, 
uh, for evaluating what those noise spectral properties look like over um, many days over the deployment. So basically the figures that are output for the B2 function, I would highly recommend always reviewing those um, to make sure that you don't have some sort of erroneous uh, instrument that you're dealing with. Um, as you get more familiar um, with the data set, the functions that plot the individual days of data um, and what the noise looks like, those types of things, um, you might not necessarily want to be spitting out all those plots because it'll be a mess. And if you have a really large data set that you're working with, um, you might not want to uh, look at all of those figures anyway. Um, uh, but I, yeah, definitely at the kind of getting an average view of what the station looks like and, and the C2, um, uh, excuse me, B2 uh, figures um, that are made from that script. I think those are the most useful ones to really look at in assessing data quality. Um, yeah, and then I, lastly too, there is an event mat to SAC um, C1 function at the end of this, um, which will um, basically just take the mat files that are used by this code and convert it back to SAC, um, uh, which might be, you know, the easiest way for you to then feed in the data, the corrected data, um, into uh, whatever sort of analysis uh, you want to do with it. Um, or, you know, you can just also take the um, mat files and feed those into, you know, whatever format of data that you uh, would work with for the codes that you want to use. Um, just make a, a quick comment on C1. Mm -hmm. It only works if you used the A1 SAC2 mat format. If you download it with the A1 download data, then it doesn't have the header information to spit out into a SAC file. So you had to originally download SAC, go into MATLAB, and then you can go back to SAC. It, 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 you, know, you need, because it needs to find that header information somewhere. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah, and then also, I think it doesn't currently work with um, this test data set just because the SAC files are formatted differently than what this function wants, but you can always go in and modify like exactly what the, what the file name structure needs to look like um, to whatever file structure you normally use for SAC, so. Yeah, and again, like I said too, this is a, a living code work in progress. So if you do use it and find any glitches or bugs or things or have ideas of, you know, um, ways we could uh, change it or, you know, add more uh, user parameters to it, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We, you know, want to make this as um, useful for the community as possible, so. Um, yeah, so I mean, unless anyone has any additional questions or anything or wants to talk about um, anything specific related to this, uh, that'll be the end of the tutorial. Cool. Well, thank you all for um, attending today. I hope that, yeah, this was helpful. Um, and uh, I hope the introduction, <laughs> introductory presentation was uh, not too dense and packed with information. So um, uh, again, I, I refer everyone to those two papers and, you know, other cited papers within, um, they, they, you know, really are the ultimate reference papers for <laughs> understanding these techniques. Um, and uh, yeah, also, you know, make friends with people who have used OBS data before. Um, that's also a, a great way to always make sure um, if you have a question about uh, your data set. Um, uh, there's definitely some people who have, you know, been doing this as part of their career longer than I've been alive. So they've, they've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah. Thank you um, so much. It's been very interesting. And um, yeah, definitely going to be very helpful. And you guys have put in so much work. I'm just amazed. <laughs> <laughs> so <Carla>. thank you. <laughs> This is basically like Helen's PhD. <laughs> like when I did <laughs> Lamont, she was like basically writing all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like it's a huge amount of work. I mean, I can see that. And um, 
but no, it's been a great summary and to get to the point they're able to run it today and say, okay, this works and this is gonna be super useful when um, yeah. we get our first OBS data back. So I'm gonna share it with the, the group here at ANU as well. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. I, I'm really excited to hear about your uh, OBS data set at some point in more detail, especially when you get it back and your experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a presentation as part, you know, part of the symposium, but obviously everything's on the seafloor at the moment. So right. fingers right. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this... Okay, well, oh, sorry. No, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, I think we can all go back to the main room at this point. Um, but yeah, again, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, joining today. Thank you, Helen. <laughs>